All right, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a very odd conversation to have here. Um, I'm going to talk about the state of CBDCs. I'm Mike Alonzo. I'm principal architect uh, for CBDCs and next generation financial market infrastructure at the Bank of International Settlements. I'm not a central banker. I'm not an economist. I don't come from banking. I actually come from this community. So I've been in Ethereum since like 2016 or so. Um, so I'm a, I'm a, a public chain maxi. Um, with that said, these views do not <laughs> reflect the reviews of the BIS. S cool. So this is the money flower. Um, it's, it's a view of different types of money. Um, on the left with the euro, you see those are your banknotes, your coins. To the right of that with the Ethereum symbol, that's crypto, stable coins. Um, to the right of that are your bank, uh, so your bank money and, and banks and stuff like that. Um, essentially, what CBDCs are trying to do is be right in the middle between peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, central bank-issued, electronic, um, and widely acceptable. So generally, when uh, people talk about CBDCs, there's two types of CBDCs that they talk about. There's wholesale, which is bank-to-bank, -bank, and retail, which is individual to merchant or individual to individual. But I like to consider a third one, which is general purpose, which is kind of both. Um, so it's, it's kind of well-defined for, uh, for both usages. But first, let's talk about wholesale. So back in 2016, uh, 2017 timeframe, central banks started playing around with central bank digital currencies, and they started doing it in uh, centralized DLTs. So they used Corda and other types of DLTs. And essentially what the experiments were, well, everyone's cool with this. It's centralized. We can issue our money. But what happens if we have to do cross-border uh, payments? What if somebody from the US comes to UCC and has to pay for things in euros? Uh, doing an integration of 190 plus central banks with centralized databases is just taking one system and putting it into another system that does the same thing, um, just with more integrations. And so you started seeing these experiments. Um, so this is the new slate of experiments where uh, basically Jura was a Swiss franc um, with a euro from Banque de France, some cool animation. And that was done on Corda. Um, we take a view back and we go to Dunbar, which was done uh, by uh, Singapore, uh, South Africa, Australia, and Malaysia. And that is a network of central banks. Uh, and it's actually EVM, uh, believe it or not. Um, it's actually a quorum. And so Hong Kong did one with uh, China, uh, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates called them Bridge, and that's also EVM based. So what you're seeing is uh, you know, two of these three networks are EVM based, um, and they're gonna have to talk to each other one day, and you know, as a public chain maxi, I think, um, you know, you might see something with a public chain integrating in, in these networks, which is actually a good thing. So let's talk about retail. This is the thing that everyone hates. Uh, it's scary, and, and I'm scared of retail, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, others are too. Um, but let's break it down and see, you know, what, what's going on here. So back in 2020, uh, the European Central Bank gave, a, gave a, a consultation and asked the public, well, what do you want in the CBDC? Well, I think it's obvious, privacy. Everyone's at privacy. They also said cryptographic is secure, cheaper, offline, and portable. No surprise here. Um, but, you know, we took that at the BIS, and we wrote a report in 2021, and we titled it The User Needs and Adoption of a CBDC. Um, we took a learnings, our consultation for the public. We asked the public what do they want, took our learnings and, and input from central bank governors, and, and looked at other failed uh, approaches and failed uh, monies. And so what we came up with these core requirements, these needs. So if you want to do a central bank digital currency, it has to have this stuff. It has to be available all the time, has to be secure, has to have instant settlement, ease of use, et cetera. But that didn't answer the user adoption stuff. And so we went further in the report, and we said, well, to get adoption, you need privacy, offline, accessibility has to be low cost. Low cost to merchants, because merchants pay a lot in, uh, in fees. Um, and if you use PayPal, so it's the same thing, right? Um, but, but the privacy thing, in that report, we wrote that individual privacy should be protected from commercial providers and governments as a basic right. I'm going to say that again. Privacy should be protected from commercial providers and governments as a basic human right. And that a CBDC can be built with more privacy because a central bank does not have the incentive to misuse that data. That's a surprise, actually. You know, but this report, the, CBD, the, the BIS report wrote this report about how do you get adoption. So privacy is a key feature. So, so a lot of banks are experimenting on CBDCs, and this is tough, because how do you get wide adoption, privacy, offline, 100% availability, um, uh, all these components in a CBDC, which, which is with a lot of throughput, that's difficult. So 
Um, so three different architectures have been proposed. Essentially, there's this UTXO model, which um, was done by others, but Project Hamilton is the one where it's, it's by the Boston Fed and MIT with some core Bitcoin folks. Um, they built it. They just basically you know, made it go really fast, and it was missing out some like, uh, key attributes like uh, programmability and some privacy. Um, Uh, the next one was uh, is DLT based. Uh, so this is, as anyone here knows, you probably a layered solution, and so that's what uh, eKrona is doing. Uh, it's basically Sweden. They're doing this layered approach, and then the Bank of Visual, which no one will surprise you, which is actually really surprising, is they're basing it off of Zcash. So whoever thought Zuko would be some part of ZPDC is actually interesting and surprising, but that's kind of cool that they're using his technology. Um, and then this last one is eCash, and that's comes the brainchild of David Chom from the 90s. He's an old school cryptographer, um, way ahead of his time. He built private money uh, that was private and anonymous, but it didn't really catch on because people really liked credit cards back in the 90s. Um, but there's a lot of research, and I think if there's something retail, it's gonna go down this route and using this architecture. So you maintain privacy and anonymity. But why am I talking to you about this stuff? We really don't probably care about this stuff. This is what I'm, I want to talk about was general purpose. How can uh, CBDC support innovation in this room right here? So I'm not gonna use names or terms or, or individual companies. I'm just gonna provide uh, a risk. And, and the best thing this community, because I come from this community, does, and nobody else really does this, is you know, we, we build things and we talk about things and we use an adversarial approach, a mindset. If you look at every white paper, what's the attack vector? What's the adversary? How do we protect against that? Because it's important. So what I'm gonna lay out is the risk of centralized stable coins. I like decentralized stable coins, they're cool, but if you look at the market share, um, most of the stable coins are made up of centralized stable coins, um, which presents a type of risk. And not a risk now, but you know, we're talking about the, when the trillions of dollars of, of stable coins are out there, they're centralized. So this is how this works. So Alice puts money into an exchange, she wants a stable coin. The exchange goes, hey, stablecoin issuer, here's some money. I want some stablecoins. Stablecoin issuer goes, okay, let's put it in my bank. Now, here's where things get weird. Um, a bank never holds that money overnight. Uh, at the end of the day, every bank basically wants to get as close to zero as possible. Um, so they put that money elsewhere. They put it in investments, they put it somewhere else, they put it in other banks. So money goes to other banks or in investments. And then at the end of the line, they all have accounts with a central bank to hold reserves that ultimately back that money. Cool. Stablecoin issuer gives you stablecoins. Alice puts it into a layer one chain. She does a swap with Bob. Bob goes ahead and puts it in a layer two and puts it into a lending protocol to earn interest. That's fine. Now let's take a look at the business model. Everything in blockchain is based off of fees. For loans, for swaps, for usage, it's fee based. Same thing with the exchanges. No surprise. Here's where things get different. The stablecoin issuer is seeking yield. They're taking your dollars and putting into investment products to earn yield. There's nothing wrong with that. Yield is good. Banks too. So what happens in a risk? What's the risk model here? What is the adversary? The adversary is what, what I would consider a DeFi bank run. So you know, there's institutions in DeFi, that's cool. But what if you know, in this world, some malicious event happens. It doesn't have to be a hacker, it just has to be loss of trust. And people need to exit and want cash or money in a bank account. And you kind of saw this happening recently, but not, that's not the scale I'm talking about is trillions here. And so everyone's making a mad rush to the exit. Everyone goes to a crypto exchange to get their stable coins. This crypto exchange is like, hey, I need money now. They get money, goes back to the exchange, and then Alice and Bob or some institution get money. Cool. It, ha it wouldn't works until it doesn't. Um, and this is what, what the quality of loans happens, uh, discussion you see happen around. Um, you know, Lehman Brothers, they failed because they had crap product, crap investments, but also in the other part of what they failed is a lot of it wasn't uh, you know, liquid. So you can have banks that have illiquid investments that they can't really just get money out real, uh, really fast. Um, so when you don't have uh, funds or liquidity, well, that's what happens. So what happened here? Um, everyone was too far away from the actual settlement asset, which in the end rolls up to the central bank. So everyone on the left side is actually still pretty good because they have a direct line to the central bank in some way, shape, or form, and they're protected through uh, legal agreements. But everyone on the right side is actually not um, protected because when you hold a coin, you can't just go to a stablecoin issuer and say, hey, I want money. 
You have to go through intermediaries for that. Um, and so if you look at the steps from the intermediaries, there's probably like four or five steps between uh, an individual on, on layer one and then six steps on a layer two to get money out in cash. And that's a massive risk. And so what I would propose is to actually move that central bank closer to the chain. And so you can have a CBDC on a mainnet and use it as collateral, direct collateral, instead of having all these intermediaries. And it's not saying that stable coins can't exist. They could. They would just use the CBDC on chain as collateral. And you can put it in protocols as collateral too, or treasuries, um, you know, given you, you would meet the, the requirements. But that's kind of a, a much safer ecosystem. And really, that's what we're trying to build is a really safe and prosperous and, and, uh, and scalable ecosystem. And you got to do it with, with good and safe money. Um, you know, you know, I love this ecosystem, and I think it could potentially have to be a victim of its own success. Um, I think it is successful now, but uh, you know, imagine a world where these risks do materialize. Um, I think you know, having a central bank closer and central bank money on public mainnets are ultimately a good thing, and I think that's what we should be striving for. So, so I really have one question, really, uh, my ask. Um, I know this is scary, and I know a lot of people don't like to talk about it, but CBDCs will be here. Um, my ask to you is, you know, who's going to build it? Uh, is it going to be people from this community, from this group, or is it going to be people with other intentions that have misaligned uh, incentives? So, so that's the question I pose to you, and, and I really want to help you guys build, uh, help, help build this with me. Thank you.